Hello again. Even at the end of a world, our paths cross once more. Dear viewer, I have a question for you. What do you think a world without women would be like? A reality where those of a female denomination disappear or die under mysterious and sudden circumstances. The fetid gremlins of a manosphere would likely rejoice. No more femoid drivers on the roads, am I right, fellow virgins? To these folk, I would retort with a message divined by God himself. But this hypothetical situation is intriguing. Just how would a post-apocalyptic world without women operate and exist? How would a society carry on in lieu of such a tragic loss? This is a scenario explored and entertained by a little game made by the prolific Dingaling, also known as Austin Jorgensen. This game is part of a trilogy of RPG Maker titles, sitting snug between the contentious Lisa the Joyful and the arachnophobic confusing drug trip that is Lisa the First. For this video essay, I want to laser focus on this middle sibling known as Lisa the Painful, a supposedly life-ruining RPG that released in 2014 to such great acclaim that has cemented it as a cult classic of the RPG maker genre. Some of the most well-known contemporaries owe their design philosophy and writing partially to this niche little slice of bizarre hell, not to mention the library's worth of spin-off and fan games inspired by this indie hit. After beating the original version back in June, I can safely say that the tagline for Painful wasn't an overestimation of itself. For two weeks after the game's conclusion, I was lethargic. I didn't want to do anything, I didn't want to go anywhere. All I could think about was Lisa. All I could think about playing was Lisa. And every waking moment of every painstaking day, I couldn't dispel the lingering melody of summer love from my mind. So after the definitive edition dropped in July, developed with help from the lovely people at Serenity Forge, I knew I would have no better time nor excuse to talk about Lisa the Painful. So please, huddle closer to the dancing flames of your campfire and confront the failures of your past over a fistful of potent painkillers, because I'm about to explain why Lisa the Painful ruined my life for two weeks. A lot of RPG Maker-esque titles following Painful tend to embody absurdity to a profound degree. There's this little niche game called Undertale, you probably haven't heard of it, but it's known for its cast of bizarre characters that involve the player in many a goofy situation that would seem far removed from the tone of the central narrative. You see this in similar titles such as Everhood and Omori, games where NPCs behave in peculiar fashions that wouldn't be out of place in the early years of the internet when Raur was I love you in Dinosaur. For the most part, it's creative, interesting, and a good way to sober up from the weight of a main story. However, I can't really say that a lot of it is funny. I think a lot of people find sections of these games funny in the sense that you can detect there's a joke there, you can discern the anatomy of a comedic bit, but it summons very little from you. Maybe my comedic standards are higher than the average internet plebeian, which would make sense because I am the most hilarious guy. So colour me surprised when Painful, a game that is almost a decade old by now, made me unleash my gay little hyena laugh on stream for all two viewers to see. You should buy me scissors. In my head I said, you should mind your own business. But in a moment I ended up saying, SHUT UP! <laughs> Alright, I'm Painful is just so bizarrely hilarious. There's an excellent combination of visual slapstick gags and dialogue jokes for not only keep the player reeled in for more, but also incentivize the player to explore and engage with the game further, thereby benefiting their overall experience through discovering hidden items that pose positive implications for their performance. Whether it's the Salvation Ranger's classic request for no race jokes, Master Friday's peculiar demeanour, the dojo sequence that involves you getting repeatedly hit in the face by rakes, Rick's very polite son, the guy who kicks you in the nuts, climbing a rope for a whole minute just to be rewarded with a middle finger, or Nern going on for 10 minutes about some fucking scissors peddling hag that ends up being his dumb potato bitch wife. There even comes a point where you track down one of your friends, Rick, and brutalise him with a spiked bat. 
This is your childhood friend, someone who got bullied and picked on and beaten alongside you, but the situation is so dire and Brad is so desperate that doing this to him is just a necessary evil. It's a moment that's dramatic and tense and shocking and waking up beside his disfigured remains leaves you absolutely speechless for a moment. And then five seconds later after walking right, this happens. Haha, I see you! Ha 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 Didn't see that coming! God, All of these moments are jarring enough to stand apart from the gloom of a narrative without compromising the sanctity of it. It also doesn't ever feel like stuff is being done completely at random, that there is some coherence or thought to the jokes being made, which can't be said for all the comparisons being made here. But this potent hilarity isn't sourced from nowhere, in the same way Brad's disastrous hairline wasn't an anomaly, but instead a result of some serious stress at home. This comes from the bright and vast cast of characters. Lisa the Painful totes a large cast of characters, and I'm not just referring to the NPCs. During your treacherous journey, you'll stumble across many a colourful character, pursuing many bizarre and interesting professions in the wastelands of Olave. The first, of course, is Terry Hintz, the Lord of the Tutorial. The guy's got many fans, and it's only through the sacrificial kindness of his bleeding, golden heart that he decides to accompany you. The second would be Nern Guan, a self-proclaimed historian who would have made a great video essayist on YouTube if the internet was still around. The third of your party would be Olan, a wandering drunkard archer that's happy to tag along for as long as there's good times and good drinks to be had. Some of you may be wondering about this guy. Why wouldn't he be the third? Don't ask stupid questions, boy. We don't recruit rage for the same reason we don't send coughing babies to Afghanistan. Beyond this loser wannabe wrestler are many a lost soul looking to join your ragtag circus of armed creeps. You have a man with a bucket for a head, a homosexual, a fish, an antisocial fly, a furry Twitter artist, the coolest bitch in the whole game, Yandere Dev, a fish lawyer wearing a top hat, a schizophrenic ex-wrestler, and fur affinity. All of them have distinct personalities and presences embodied in their interactions with you, Brad Armstrong. Some love you, some hate you, and some share latent homosexual feelings for you. Austin Jorgensen confirmed to me, in confidence, that Tiger Man is Brad's male wife bitch. This isn't wishful thinking, nor is it the topic of my frenzied and depraved porn searches. This is irrefutably true and you're just going to have to deal with that. Every encounter and cross path feels curated and tailored specifically for the best first time experience possible. This makes sense. Painful is an extremely linear game where certain areas and story beats can only be experienced in a set stringent order, but I'd take this any day over the heaps of procedurally generated garbage the AAA industry tries to peddle as modern innovation. Would you rather have a sentimentally salient first time experience that places the game in your own personalised hall of fame for you to reflect upon fondly, or a product that replaces all opportunity for personal attachment and recognition with algorithmic generation posing as technological advancement. Yet the depth of this intriguing cast, as well as the splendour of this ravaged post-apocalyptic world, can't be appreciated like this without the necessary presentation. On paper, this all sounds great. But this isn't a book, it's an instalment in a budding interactive visual medium. Get that nerd shit out of my face. No, my dear viewer, the true extent of these characters' significance is realised through the music and art direction. For the uninitiated in my pitiful existence, I am something of an art curator, a savant, an enthusiast. Why, just take a look at my search history. Only the most talented are worthy of my lingering gaze. So when said lingering gaze passes over least of a painful, it sends signals along my optic nerves to my occipital lobe and delivers information for my aesthetically pleasing smooth brain to decipher. And the information is as follows. It's ugly. Painful's absurdity doesn't just stop at its humour or its cast of mentally ill societal outcasts. NPCs and enemies have ridiculous faces and bodies with laughable hairlines to boot. Even a supposedly handsome look like they're made out of wet plasticine and melting wax. The environments are bleak, formed of open stretches of tundra with the occasional cliff face and cave tunnel system to interrupt the monotony. My summary of Painful's visual presentation isn't a critique, it's praise. 
Lisa the Painful presents a world that is completely devoid of purpose. No jobs, few hobbies beyond beating strangers to death, and nothing but a couple pockets of strained civilization. What we would associate with humane living, with a humane existence, was lost long before the game started. To be in a world that looks as alien and unwelcoming as Olave works really well. Those that survive the Flash are but the remains of once civilized people, their violence and savagery unrestrained by societal norms and the hefty consequences of violating them. Gang members look fierce and weird, so alien to the idea of peaceful resolution that a swift thrashing is the only viable option. The monstrous beasts you encounter look even more troubling, amalgamations of malice and hatred that manifest in the most menacing of forms. A fast food employee stuck in a costume with a head made of minced meat, shadow people lurking in the dark caves, ferocious canines running loose that must be vanquished for the good of the people, and the fleshy horrors of the joy mutants. Bodies contorted and distorted by grief and failure into such horrifying forms and shapes that comprise all they are now. Testament to unrelenting violence that are impulsive, unstable, and capable of murder. The environments may be bleak, but they're not uninteresting. You'll stumble across gyms, dojos, gang hideouts, gambling halls where bets are placed on people's very lives, islands of literal garbage inhabited by the most unsanitary yet most friendly citizens in the entire game, and numerous bars, shops, and inns. All of these locales and amenities are scattered across the sprawling world of Olave. Swamps, snowy mountains, sand dunes, and stony cliffsides all encompass the realm of which your terrible journey takes place within. But while my eyes are relaying this information to my brain, what are my ears doing? Well, the sound waves travel through the ear canals to my eardrums and vibrate three tiny bones in my middle ears, which then moves the fluid that bends my delicate hair cells, and the vibrations of these cells are converted into nerve impulses. So what do these impulses tell me? It sounds ugly. I'm not able to use half the music of the OST for the video because of how ridiculously chaotic it sounds. If you played these to a Victorian child, they would explode End of Evangelion style. Of course, I think this is, again, a piece of praise for Painful. For such a weird world, one deprived of the typical instruments and utensils we'd have in the civilized days, it makes sense for music to be these jarring cacophonies for both fights and general areas. I Am Satan is one of my favourite tracks because it's both rhythmic enough to be discernibly enjoyable, yet still weird and utilises a fucking chiptune laugh as one of its main instruments. Whatever Austin is smoking, I need some of that stuff. War season, ah war season, nothing makes me want to get involved in gang war shenanigans more than war season. Ruling, classic, absolutely, really makes me want to beat up a dog. All Hail the Fishmen is a song that uses chains. Chains. Men at work makes me feel like I'm gonna have a heart attack in a construction site. But the music isn't just this bombastic battle track. How can you discern the highs without the lows to compare them to? Walking through stretches of a wasteland will accompany you with some mellow trumpet playing. Journeying through the caves will play some creepy, quiet music. Hell, some of the fights aren't action-packed brawls against formidable foes, but instead desperate, pitched battles against affronts to the human condition. Fighting a joy mutant is a calculated risk for reasons we'll talk about later, and the music embodies said risk. Even if you're unaware of their lethal potential, you're still uneasy when up against them. How can you discern the motivations and strategies of a crying and screaming sack of mutated flesh? But of course, we'd be remiss not to discuss the piece de resistance of Lisa the Painful. Summer Love Summer Love is a track that haunts me. It's used in the beginning of the game, played to a far more upbeat and fast tune just to be cut off by the catastrophic beatdown Brad gets, sets the tone for just how things are going to play out from now on. From that point on, the track is slower, more melancholic, a reflection on days long gone but you're unsure were better or worse than they are now. It's the music of a mind pondering so many unanswerable questions while wandering aimlessly through the sandy expanses of Olave. It's ambivalent and it's... God, it just sounds so good. It's the crowning achievement of this game musically. There's never going to be anything more evocative of Lisa than Summer Love and child abuse, but we'll get to that later. Both the pixel art and music work in tandem with one another to create atmosphere and evoke feelings from the player. How one looks and the music that accompanies said looks weighs a lot in the player's first impressions of a character. Fighting Tiger Man with his epic score in the background makes me feel like I'm truly fighting some warrior champion. 
that he is a fearsome foe, whereas fighting Han Tsunami's seven strong group in the bathhouses is a menacing affair in dealing with ruthless and cruel men. For someone who was, at the time of the original, not really well versed with making music, Dingaling channeled their inexperience into one of the most bizarre, memorable, and frankly brilliant soundtracks I've heard. But Mr. Jorgensen, you made a fatal error. There's a little track that plays in the gym called Work Harder. This track in the original is a rather comedic use of a Shenmue 2 grunting sound. It's far from a good song, but it's not meant to be a good song. It's funny, and that's all it needs to be. I liked it, everyone liked it, Dunkey liked it, and if Dunkey liked something, well, that's all the information you need. So what was going through your head to change the song? Why? Now it sounds warbled and distorted and disgusting. My benching bros would not listen to this during their sessions. My immersion is ruined, my involvement in a story has been compromised, and I damn you to hell for all eternity where Satan will force you to watch Matt Pat excruciatingly compare the culmination of your hard work and effort to a game that came after yours, making your creative passions live in the shadows of another's different work. But he asked me to do it! Is this a genocide run or something? <laughs> This is just a quick side tangent, because famously I am extremely succinct and never go off topic in videos, but Queen Roger. My god, what a great character. There have been some people on the internet that have circulated the idea that the scene with Queen Roger is somehow transphobic or problematic. I think this stems from a problem we have where we teach people that articles of bigotry, like transphobia, are wrong, but we don't actually teach people how to discern it. So when you have a character as upfront and unapologetic as Queen Roger, some people may get nervous that it's done in mean spirits, or it's a bad faith caricature, and denounce it as problematic but I disagree most vehemently. Lisa the Painful was a game made in 2014. This was a time where you could be the Ace Ventura of transphobes and you'd get critical acclaim from anyone online. This was such a sweet low hanging fruit that Dingaling could have used for cheap humor, but he didn't. You know what he did? He made this faction of cross-dressing gay men into the most civilized, badass, morally wealthy, and kind-hearted group of people in the entire game. He didn't have to do that, and the fact he did shows a deliberate respect for it. Some of you probably don't give a shit, but I sincerely think this was really nice and done in a way that didn't feel heavy-handed. Also, side tangent of a side tangent, shit like this is so hilarious to me. This manufactured culture war idiocy puffing up your chest about how painful a game completely different to Undertale is better because it was made by a straight white man who understands the importance of family. My brother in Christ, not only does the definitive edition outright say Brad wanted to try on his mother's clothes, but he also has gay sex in a degrading dress. I hope a bald, emotionally repressed middle-aged man kicks you in the nuts really hard. All of this stuff is great, it's good, but what about the game? How does painful work mechanically? What is there to work with? I'm glad you asked, dear viewer, because Lease of a Painful mechanically is an extremely satisfying game. Playing painful involves two things, exploring and brawling. Oh, my bad, bro. The first part is generally how you traverse the world. Your journey is split up into three different hub worlds that connect to smaller individual areas via caves and entrances. To advance the game, only some of these are mandatory, and the player can investigate the other zones or ignore them to their heart's content. Those who roam with curiosity guiding them will find a wealth of new supplies, new party members, and funny little interactions for them to enjoy. Getting the bike does a lot for your means of exploration. You can revisit a few of the beginning areas to grab loot previously unobtainable and reach ledges that you couldn't before. But the terrain of Olave is far from friendly, and the game doesn't hold your hand. Take one wrong step and... Well... We're so bad, gamers. Oh, but... There's also a number of towns and settlements around the place that offer you the opportunity to outfit yourself and your party with better gear. By cashing in your stash of sultry porn magazines, you can improve your party's standings in battle. Visiting these places also grants you some healing and combat items, like pots of soup to heal or diesel generators to gift your enemies with a few doses of delicious cocktails. This, of course, is only possible if you have bottles. These glass receptacles may seem fairly innocent at first, but collecting them not only allows you to use these in-town amenities, but can also be used as weapons in lieu of other alternatives. While the amount in the world are finite, you can always get more by purchasing some alcohol from bars. 
Keeping your local businesses up is an important civic duty, after all. But eventually during your exploration, you'll encounter men of disagreeable inclination, and will have to brawl it out to see who lives and who dies. You play as Brad Armstrong, a martial arts teacher with his own body as his weapon. Being able to combo in the turn-based game wasn't something I thought I needed, but now that I have it, I'm not playing another game without it. The animations that accompany this assault make combos super satisfying, and, even better, Brad's not the only one capable of doing this. With Brad being the damage-dealing anchor of your party, you can bring three other members with you to form different compositions. The three first people you pick up, Nern, Terry, and Olan, will become quite a devastating trio provided you put the time in to train them up. This helps you endure the early game of the first area, where you're arguably at your weakest point before finding many more party members in the second area. There are many status debuffs and buffs to apply to yourselves and the enemy that pose interesting implications for how to best defeat your foes. Painful embodies exactly what I always look for in turn-based RPGs. There's a visceral glee that comes from having a party that ping-pongs the enemy to and fro between them, using moves to complement one another's attacks that ultimately seal your adversary's fates. The boss fight in the bathhouse made me cackle like an insane person when I managed to decimate them so easily. <laughs> Here I was thinking this would be a fucking struggle. For such a linear game, you get brought back to play again and again by just how fun it is. Now, you might be saying, Smug, you dumb bitch, all you've been doing is talking about how much you love Lisa the Painful. I thought you said it ruined your life. And you'd be right, dear viewer. It did ruin my life. A big part of that is down to the narrative, something we'll get into shortly, but part of it is also owed to the sheer difficulty of the game. Mechanically, Lease of a Painful can be considered a difficult game for the many choices it puts in front of you. One of these choices revolves around the scarcity of resources. With no real healer class in your available roster, you're going to rely on finite items to heal your HP and SP. This costs magazines, and the good stuff isn't exactly cheap. Low HP and SP limit your ability to fight well, so ignoring it isn't an option either. One potential choice is using a campfire, a resting point where your party can fully recover for free. Sleeping out in the open, however, is dangerous business, and you may wait up to a party member being kidnapped or your items being stolen. You can negate this by sleeping at an inn, but this costs a few magazines, something that early on may be too precious to cough up. Knowing when to use your magazines and when to hoard them can also be a tricky dilemma, exemplified in the Road Scholars encounter. After a brief visit to Factory Town, you are ambushed by a five-strong gang of hooligans. You have the option to cough up all your mags, and in return, they'll graciously let you and the town be. You either still have a lot of mags that you want to keep for some crucial healing items, or you don't have any because you spent them all in town. Refusing to comply or not having enough magazines will prompt the Road Scholars to pummel you into dust. This fight is extremely hard because of a plethora of moves the gang has to stun your party and knock them over, taking away crucial turns that could be used to to win. If you lose, and you most likely will lose, the gang will take all of your mags and then go destroy the town, depriving you of a potentially key area to trade. There are a set of firebombs in the town you can employ to deal with the enemy, but this also poses a dilemma. Should I use them here, or should I try fighting it out normally and save them for a potentially more troublesome enemy? There's a really nice quote from H-Bomber Guy's Deus Ex video, where he says that games that present you with meaningful choices should make you a little nervous when you get new equipment, and Painful does that really well for items such as firebombs, fancy perfumes, and a little something called joy. What made my life particularly stressful for this fight is that Brad was suffering from withdrawal at the time. Withdrawal is a status debuff where generally Brad becomes weaker. His combo moves do almost no damage, he goes last in the party, and his HP and SP are lower. This can be remedied with a delightful little blue pill called Joy. This grants an insanely powerful buff to anyone who uses it, greatly increasing your chances of critical hits as well as damage output. Using Joy helps you when withdrawal has struck at a pretty inconvenient time, but it also means in the long run you're going to become pretty dependent on it, which is only going to hurt you. Joy is also finite, and the more you use it, the more Brad is going to get withdrawal symptoms, and the more often you're going to be put in a difficult spot. And just like addiction at first, it can be hard to endure that longing ache, but over time, it will become less and less troublesome, as Brad and his party get stronger and stronger. It's a really neat mechanic that contextualizes the narrative in your actual experience of the game, instead of it being a source of lunar narrative dissonance. Speaking of joy, these guys. Hello! They're tough, 
scarily strong, and will get in your way time and time again. But did you know, however, that they're also TikTok chiropractors at heart? That's right, they'll snap your neck. These moves can come at any time during a fight, in the same way withdrawal can strike at any moment. Killing them often gets you some delicious joy, which can be good for consumption or for selling at high prices, as well as access to other items you may need. Not all of them are compulsory fights, so engaging a joy mutant is a calculated risk, and my god, you better be good at maths. <gasps> he just fucking killed me! Painful presents a lot of cool decisions in the gameplay that are ultimately meaningful to how your run goes, but I will say there are some aspects of it I remain ambivalent towards. Because this thing sucks dick. <laughs> Before arriving in Area 2, a rather unseemly gentleman kidnaps you and forces you and your party to win a simple little game three times in a row before letting you go. This game is called Russian Roulette. Whoever dies first loses, and to the victor go the spoils. But if you lose, your party member dies permanently. Go in with fear. Don't fear the gun. The gun is on your side. Don't worry about it. Now at this point you have more than 3 party members, if this happened where you had to play 3 games, win or lose before continuing, this would be absolutely fine. If you win all 3, great, but if you lose all 3, you're not going to be without a full party and it further incentivizes you to use new members in areas 2 and even 3. But that's not what happens, you have to win 3. Multiple times I was completely wiped out and I had to redo the whole section again, which just makes me wonder what the point even is. If it's not to just partially call my roster, then all it serves to do is be a completely unreasonable and brutal, albeit interesting, change of pace. Everything else about this is fine, going back and playing after this is fine, because it's voluntary and the player understands the stakes, but the way it's introduced and how it can completely decimate your party in this really arbitrary manner doesn't shoot straight at all. Fuck. Up until now we've spoken about the ways in which Lisa works really well as a game and through how said game is presented. Its chaotic absurdity manifests itself in a lot of different ways aesthetically, yet there's a consistent order to how it plays that the player has a way to navigate the psychedelic mess. Very little of it is actually painful. A difficult, sure, but where's the supposed agony that I've been talking about? Well, I've got it figured out. How Painful Plays is alluring, its art and music are inviting, and it all works to usher in a false sense of security to deal with the true excruciating pain I've been talking about this whole time. Its ability to work well as a game is the method of which the player lowers their guard and makes the mistake of investing themselves in Brad Armstrong's bizarre adventure. The story begins as any good story does. Child abuse. A blink of an eye and you're in the arid wastelands of Western Olaf, and before you is a vulnerable child. Not just any child though, the last human girl in a world without women. Brad takes it upon himself to raise and care for his adopted daughter Buddy in a world full of cruelty and violence, one inhabited with plenty of Minecraft YouTubers. After caving to his drug addiction once more, Brad wakes up after blacking out and realises his home has been raided and Buddy is gone. With that, the world crumbles into chaos, and your mission as this washed up martial arts instructor is clear. Save Buddy. What's important to note about Painful is the world. The post-apocalyptic setting, one that has come about under mysterious circumstances, is a very novel and unique idea, and that's kind of the point of the genre, devising how the world would continue different to the one we have now. So how just would people cope in a world without women? Well, straight people, anyway. As we've discussed, the gay men are thriving, but what's even more impressive is the thought that went into every aspect of this post-apocalyptic society. The social facade that is money's intrinsic value has plummeted, and as a result, there's only one thing left that holds value. Literature that aids in one's ability to blast rope. Magazines of the saucy variety is the only currency traders are interested in anymore, used to purchase the gallons of alcohol the survivors use to drown their virgin sorrows. The alternative is joy an inoffensive little blue pill that dulls one to the pain of a world, and you find those who indulge in it littered throughout your journey. Olave is a world that is devoid of purpose, its life withering away, and the player soon realises that all that still matters, all that can hope to still matter, 
is Buddy. Brad's adventure brings him through many perilous encounters that don't just pose implications for the narrative alone, but one's actual experience of the game. At three points you will cross paths with a mysterious and elusive character known as Buzzo, a joy-spreading pariah leading a large group of misfits and lunatics, all donning smiling masks. At every junction, Buzzo offers you a choice of increasing severity. Two of them are gameplay sensitive, either you give up one of your arms, thereby increasing the frequency of withdrawal and permanently lowering your stats drastically, or you let Buzzo execute some of your party members and steal all of your inventory. At the moment in which these dilemmas occur, you likely have your best guys equipped in your roster and have done a ton of side content to get the best loot. Do you want to further hinder the one constant to your party, or do you want to sacrifice your party? specific capabilities. But a third one, rather amazingly, manages to prove just as difficult without posing any gameplay implications. At the second junction, Buzzo offers you a simple choice, the life of your free enrolled party members or Buddy's nipple cut off with a sword. This is a harrowing choice to make. The whole point of this mission, the thing that has justified the violence and show of force taken to get to this point, is in jeopardy. She's a kid about to be mutilated, used as a prop in Buzzo's sick game to mess with Brad. You can accept this just fine, and nothing bad happens, you'll get a disembodied nipple to carry around, but it's just not easy to agree to. You're in tandem with how Brad feels at this moment, for the reason of saving the human race or wanting to protect Buddy from the legions of Onisions and EDPs out to get her, you are conflicted with letting this happen. And what works really well for the story of Lisa the Painful are the characters, specifically Brad's troop, the antagonists, and Buddy. The way the events of the plot are arranged makes it feel like these are extraordinary events happening to ordinary people. Sure, Brad is able to Hadouken the shit out of his foes, but he's written to be a mentally ill, fragile man doing his best in a cruel, cruel world. An abused child who is doing his damnedest to stop another child being used for horrible, disgusting things. Because, let's be real for a second, repopulating the human race involves activities that a child shouldn't be within a mile of. Activities that, unfortunately, would likely not involve consent. The issue is bigger than the fate of one little girl, yet in a story that is so revolved around the fate of the individual, you're united with Brad in this idea that it's not an acceptable way to view Buddy. She's just a kid, who, completely independent of her thoughts and feelings on the matter, gets saddled with the potential fate of the world. This becomes a point of contention between Brad and his surviving friends, Sticky and Rick, who wanted to give Buddy over to the Rando army because they would know what to do with her. You can understand the motivations of such actions, even if they do embrace the possibility she's going to be taken advantage of and used, but you can also again understand Brad's opposition to it. Even if you can't condone the violent reprimand he delivers upon his ex-friends, you understand the reason behind it. What really invested me in the story of Painful is this really intriguing meld of the past and present. Painful follows on after Lisa the First, a game that details the psychedelic experiences and thought process of a traumatised and abused child who eventually decides to conclude her own existence. It's annoying as hell that YouTube censorship makes me talk about something really tragic and poignant in such a hackneyed manner so some mobile phone scam ad feels comfortable playing on my video, but regardless, this is the terrible glue that holds the cast of Painful together in this torturous web. Brad's guilt is made evident throughout the game. He's constantly greeted with flashbacks and visions of Lisa herself, an eternal torment of the kid he couldn't save. It explains why he's so hell-bent on saving Buddy from a similar fate, even if part of his net good may stem from his own desire to redeem himself. This is quite a literal example of how he can't escape his past that works well, a direct fusion of the past and present, but what I like even more so is how all of those he knew in his childhood play key roles in his adulthood. His childhood bullies are the side antagonists that seek to harass and interrupt his mission. His childhood friends betray him and steal away Buddy. His student and adopted son, Dustin, is Rando himself. It's an excellent metaphor executed brilliantly that further shows how inescapable the past is for Brad, that even in this supposed new lease on life, the articles of guilt still seek to interfere and obstruct him from redemption. As the comic relief fades away and the finale of the game nears, Brad's desperate struggle is brought to its lowest point. On an island, hidden away from the rest of the mad world, is his own father. It's the first time Brad would have seen Marty since Lisa's death, and in the long time since then, he's evidently changed. He's looking after Buddy, taking care of her with love and affection you've never seen before, and the player is given a choice. Do you want to kill your own father? 
Any sane person would say yes to this. After all, the alternative technical term for a meat grinder is a nonce disposal unit, and Marty inflicted atrocities upon Lisa that can't go unpunished. But the problem here, however, is Buddy. Should she have to bear witness to another act of violence, saddled with the baggage of a relationship she wasn't involved in? Whatever you say, it doesn't matter. You pummel the ever-living shit out of Marty, and unfortunately Buddy, completely oblivious to the history between Brad and his father, gets in the way. And now, suddenly, you find yourself in the exact same position Marty had been in at the start of the game. You have to beat and hurt the girl you wanted to protect in order to kill your father. In the end, there's not much left of him, or his legacy. Pursuing Buddy to Rando's Island on the floating corpse of yet another nonce, you save her from the ravenous clutches of yet another creep from the past before you soon realise Buddy's perspective on all of this. She thinks Brad has denied her a choice, a meaningful decision that can free her from a life of playing hostage, and every attempt to liberate herself has been thwarted by Brad barging in. He's murdered people in front of her, done drugs and alcohol in front of her, and all the while she's been told monstrous things about him from people like Sticky and Rick. Brad did a lot of these things to protect her. He assumes the worst of the world as a result of his upbringing, one where he believes everyone and anyone is out to use you for their own gain, and the current state of Ole vindicates such misshapen thinking. Buddy's potential fate is pretty evident when you visit the men's hair club and find a crying man tied up in the back where people have been taking goes at him, mistaken for the girl everyone's looking for. Buddy can't possibly see things this way, and instead, before her is a cruel and awful person who wants to lock her up in a cage to keep to himself. This moment, one where Brad discovers just how badly he has failed, is followed by a final showdown against a concentration of Rando's army, as well as your own party who denounce your actions and turn on you. As Brad fights on, his offensive capabilities and stats improving with every subsequent fight, you see a few familiar moves in your moveset. Ones that only those warped by joy could use in combat. Through these warning signs made apparent through the components of the game itself, Brad's fate becomes clear. Brad has to face down Rando, the adopted son that he left behind long ago, and confront an enraged and petrified buddy. If you're not a psychopath, your final decision will be to embrace the broken and battered shell of a man, and feel the emotional evisceration the conclusion brings. Buddy? Yes? Did I do the right thing? I fucking hate this game so much! I hate this game! Fuck you, ding a -ling. Oh. Lisa the Painful is a tragic tale. A story of good intentions that pave a circular unending road forever feeding back into itself, damned to torture future generations of the pain predecessors sought to spare them from. In Brad's most earnest efforts to save Buddy from a world that wanted to eat her alive, all he did was alienate her from childlike innocence and unknowingly hurry her into a violent, bloodthirsty living. The demise of Brad's humanity, ushering in the torturous existence as a being of violent impulse, is a bitter conclusion to the story. All you can do is sit there and listen to that mellow music and confront the hollow, bald man-shaped hole in your heart. Painful let me experience and invest myself in a brilliant story that, after beating the game, I didn't think at all could get any better. So when the definitive edition released with a supposed secret ending, I braced myself for a final bout of emotional turmoil. <laughs> After seeing this video on my feed and looking at the first steps, I discovered that after constructing the boat to get to Marty's Island, you can go back to the very first campfire and rest. Doing so traps you inside an insane nightmare that makes the most of the Unity engine for this game. One of your first fights is against the Crow of Remembrance, the system of which you save, and it works well as a metaphor also. This fight is Brad bracing himself to reflect upon the trauma of the past, to confront the thousand faces of impotent rage that the song is named after. Also, brief side note, this song to an optional fight in a completely optional sequence has no business being this damn good. After beating the crow, you're confronted with a genuinely starting jump scare of Buzzo and the song One Mask of Infinite Rage. 
Oh my god. What the fuck? Also another good metaphor, where all of these indistinguishable faces of those Brad has wronged all fuse into this one representative mask belonging to the guy that insists on pursuing him to the ends of the earth. Buzzo is a fantastic character that serves for metaphor of guilt coming back to always stop Brad in a really, really good way. The reason he's so pertinent to the plot is because he was Lisa's best friend in childhood and had feelings for her. This person adjacent to the horrid tragedy of the Armstrong family becomes the bane of Brad's existence, this almost supernatural phantom of guilt that always manifests itself at the worst times to thwart and torture Brad. You can't fight him because you lose, you can't reason with him because you lose, you can't escape him because he'll always find a way to find you. The nightmare continues, revealing how Brad ran away with his grandfather and the conversations he had with his bitter father leading up to his departure, before he's confronted with this monstrosity. The manifestation of Marty. And genuinely, this becomes the crowning achievement both narratively and mechanically of Lisa the Painful. How the fight works is as follows. Commencing an assault on Marty involves three phases. The first is a fight against shadow versions of your party, the second against a group of Marty's spiders, and the third against Marty himself. Upon reaching Marty, you realise just what a severe undertaking the ordeal is. You have a hundred thousand health to whittle through. Destroying the disgusting sacks on his fleshy mounds gives you nourishing sack fluid, an important tool for later use. You fight on and on until an animation starts playing when Marty grabs one of your party members, drags them down and- Your party member awakes in a cavern of wrinkled and hairy flesh. From the undergrowth of layered meat, spider legs latch onto the member and drag them beneath the surface into the depths of the horrid beast. They disappear, a petal floats down from the sky, and the game informs you that the party member has been consumed by Marty. They're not just dead, they're completely undone. This animation is so grotesque and horrid that fighting him becomes way more terrifying than any Joy Mutant could ever be. The intended approach of this fight is, every time you flee from the battle to escape Marty's consumption, you have to restart the assault. The nourishing sacks allow you to level up underleveled members to the highest level of your party, meaning that you have your entire roster up until this point to employ in your offensive. With every retreat, however, the enemy gets harder. Shadows are able to reflect damage and eventually will KO your party members upon death. This motherfucker called Tricky Ricky arrives with the spiders, ones that now begin to bear the heads of your consumed party members, and he'll proceed to buff his own team and heavily debuff yours. All of this struggle just to get another shot at besting the cruel manifestation of your father. I've seen some contention about this fight online with some people saying that it's too much to be fair, that having to go all the way back up through the first two phases is padding, and so on. At first, I agreed, but as I continued on, I actually really came to love it. Repeated attempts grant you many duplicates of items already in your inventory. Not only do I think this fight is fair, I think it's better than what we get in the true ending. Narratively, it makes sense for the final fight to be between two people. The climax is more intense, the stakes are higher, and it invokes the feeling of a final showdown. But turn-based RPGs are fun because of your ability to build compositions and employ complementary movesets, which then in turn allows for more complex battles and difficult fights. When you bring it down to just one versus one, it becomes a glorified game of punches. If Painful wasn't as powerfully written as it was, me repeatedly hitting my adopted son with diesel firebombs would be a more comedic affair. So getting to this fight where you actually have to use your party roster in its entirety to best a seemingly impossible foe is tense to do, where their lives are truly on the line. At any point, my tiger male wife bitch could have been consumed, and for a man like me, that would have been the final straw. This narrative climax feels like it's truly testing all the skills I've acquired up until now, and that feeling was exemplified when this motherfucker's head started bobbing and began to permanently drain my stats every single turn. This fight also, again, is a brilliant metaphor for Brad's likely physical altercations with his father. Every time he wanted to stand up for himself, it was an exhausting affair of building up the courage to challenge someone far taller and more imposing than him. A fight where his strikes did little, and in order to recover, he'd have to run away and flee the battle before building up the courage to try again. Struggles that are so taxing, it permanently affects Brad for the worst, all the while the poisoned relationship with his father seeks to snuff out and consume all sources of positivity and friendship Brad has. How could Brad ever have any friends when the looming darkness of his home life 
always gets in the way, where only the presence of his sister, embodied in the petals of a dead flower, can bolster Brad's fight. The nightmare concludes with a young Brad talking to his sister one last time before running away, laughing about their doomed situation, and for a moment, there's a lapse in the impenetrable fog where it seems like Brad has found peace. A second where the broken man has found closure. In confronting his most terrifying demons, he finally is able to face the truth and better himself for it. But Lisa the Painful isn't a happy game. There's no happy ending for someone like Brad. Returning to the surface, you find the decaying remains of Marty that speak a few final haunting words. He is in Brad's veins. His influence can never be dispelled for longer than a fleeting moment, and the silhouette of a reforming mountain indicates the futile effort of it all. Now, is this a secret ending? No. You wake up and your party members are dead, likely killed by Brad during the night, and the game still ends as usual. Advertising it as such is a bit misleading, Ted Dogger, and if we ever do something like this again, I am going to head slide your entire family. But not only does it give us important insight into Brad's mental state and past, it also combines with the true ending to give us important lessons. The cycle of abuse makes monsters of children and adults. One's perspective can misinterpret even the best of intentions as evil and what you're taught can truly become what you are. Brad was taught to assume the worst of a world, and because of that, was so ready to abandon it to save Buddy. But as a result, Buddy was taught to fear everyone, and soon came to revile one of the few men who truly wanted to keep her safe. And at the end of this video essay, one that was both painful to write and edit, this is why Lisa the Painful ruined my life for two weeks. And after that, well, what else is there left to say?